You know, I really love Psalm 103. Uh, you'll see why in a minute here. It's really encouraging. Um, it's also a little factoid here. It's also the center of the Bible. It's uh, right at the center of the Bible. It's um, um, the same number of verses, not chapters, but the same number of verses are before it or after it. And I'm looking at the King James Bible. That might vary a little bit from whatever Bible you're using. But there's about 15,500 uh, 15, verses before and the same number after uh, Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. So the, these verses here, and let me switch my screen so you can see what I'm looking at. These verses here are the very center of God's Word, the very center of the Bible. Now, when I say the center, I'm talking about the physical center. As I said, 15,550 verses before and after these. Uh, not necessarily the theological center. I think that's in uh, Romans chapter 4. Maybe I'll do a special on that one. But uh, that seems to be the theological center. But this is the physical center of the Bible. So here we are. Uh, this is a psalm. Uh, I've entitled this, Why Worship? Why Worship? And what that psalm is going to, this psalm is going to answer that question. You know, we're we're often, and I've done it, I mean, we've we've talked a lot about how to worship uh, in terms of uh, worship with enthusiasm and sincerity and fervor and repentance, fear, thanksgiving. I've even mentioned several times how loud worship is. It's to be loud. Uh, this psalm tells us why, gives us a whole series of reasons why we are to worship. And it's important to us because if you look at uh, verse 2, the last part here, call that a cola. It's, by the way, that's a two cola verse. Uh, forget none of his benefits. This is kind of an acknowledgement uh, of how weak and frail we are, how superficial and shallow we sometimes find ourselves, that we have to be reminded of the benefits of God. We have to have our minds redirected from wherever they're at to the Lord and be reminded of his benefits. And that's what this does. That's what this uh, uh, psalm is doing. In my reading of this, and I'll challenge you to read it yourself and see what you come up with. But as I read the psalm, I come up with 14 different, well, 14 reasons to worship. Sometimes they're repeated. But the psalmist, David, lays out 14 reasons to worship. It's again, kind of a longish, longish psalm. So I'll give you some guidance here. Uh, verses 1 and 2, in terms of an outline guidance, uh, verses 1 and 2 are a call to praise God. So this is a, a uh, kind of the um, uh, call to worship that uh, we do uh, to praise him. And then verses 3 all the way down to verse 29. Oh, 19 perhaps. Maybe I didn't do this right. Yeah, down to 19 is um, uh, in this outline are the reasons to praise him. And this, this section 3 down to 19 is really divided up into uh, two sections. Verses 3 through 12 talk about God's work what he has done that's praiseworthy. It's reminding us of what he has done. Verses 13 to 19 are his person, his character, the attributes of God. Why are we, these are attributes that are praiseworthy uh, for the Lord. So that, as you go through that, make note of that. 3 through 12 is work, 13 through 19 is person. And then it closes in verses 20 to 22 the way it opened, really, with another call to praise God. Let me focus on our highlight verse, good verse to really meditate on as we go through this. And I think, you know, one of the things I like about it is this verse. Uh, why should we praise God? He's the one who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. 
What a what a wonderful wonderful thing here. Let me read to you what uh, Charles Spurgeon. I don't know if that's a uh, familiar name for you. Uh, who is a um, a uh, pastor, uh, probably the first what we would call megachurch pastor in London in uh, the 1800s. Uh, he was a pastor from the time he was about 19 years old. Interesting, he took on a church that was about, uh, that was dying, a church of about 20 people, and grew it to a church of over 12,000. Uh, so, so, um, so much growth at one point that he asked the regular members of the church not to come one Sunday a week in order to allow room for the visitors that were streaming in. So, Spurgeon writes this, he focuses in that word satisfies, and he says, a rare word, it rings like a silver bell, satisfaction. The richest man in England has not found it. The greatest conqueror has never won it. The proudest emperor cannot command it. Satisfaction, it is no more natural to man. It is a spiritual blessing a divine grace that comes from the great, satisfying God, the God who is himself all-sufficient, the only one who can be sufficient to fill the human heart. Oh, goodness, uh, what a uh, rare commodity, really, satisfaction is. It seems like we are a bundle of dissatisfaction, a bundle of wants and demands, and it eats up our years, doesn't it? It just eats up our years with the pursuit of things. He says, your years with good things, youth is renewed. This is a promise uh, that God offers really vigor, productivity, effectiveness into old age for those who seek their satisfaction in him. Uh, this is not to say, you know, of course, that uh, we're not going to come to a time when our minds and body have done all they can do to be a tool for our soul. It's not to say that there's not a time coming when our minds and bodies just wear out and we've done what we can to serve the Lord. But it is to say that we're going to have strength and stamina to carry out what the Lord intends for us if we seek our satisfaction in him. A couple Psalms reinforce this. Um, it's not just me making this up. Uh, Psalm 1, which I've alluded to before, kind of the gateway Psalm, uh, says this in verse 3. He will be, this is the guy who is meditating on God's word and whose delight is in it, will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever it does prospers. So the picture here is a person is like a tree, and just like a tree has different seasons as through their lives and existence, so that tree produces appropriate fruit for that particular time of their life. So shall we produce the right kind of fruit as we mature. Psalm 92, 14 says, Again, the righteous will yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. That doesn't mean silly, sappy. It means that you're going to be full of life right to the end until God doesn't need you anymore. You'll be ministering. And so many, like Spurgeon uh, that I just read, uh, continue to minister uh, beyond the grave that their words resound and res resonate uh, down through the ages. One of the things I encourage people to do, especially as you get older, is to uh, get a Bible. I've got one here that has big margins. I don't know if you can see that. Let me get that. It's got a kind of large margin there you can write in it. Uh, make an effort to write in the margin legibly on how particular scriptures are impacting you or directing your life. And then make sure that when you go to be with the Lord, you leave that Bible with someone who will appreciate it. Someone perhaps who will read your notes 
and being moved and encouraged and edified. So do that and leave that for them so that you're, you too, perhaps beyond your death, will continue to produce fruit. Wouldn't that be great to look down from heaven and have the Lord show you uh, what you wrote and what you left behind is impacting friends, neighbors, children, grandchildren, perhaps great-grandchildren that you leave your Bibles to. How do we respond to this? Well, I think there's a few different ways, you know. If you're young, uh, let me encourage you to go out of your way to value and respect the older believers, the more mature believers among you. Uh, so often, uh, older believers are undervalued and under-respected. And let, let, that should not happen. That should not happen in God's church. So if you're young, resp you know, respect and value the elderly. Uh, if you're middle-aged, uh, prepare yourself now to be that wise sage. Uh, be collecting guidance and direction from God's word. Put it to work in your life. The more you do that, the more you'll learn. Uh, understanding comes to the doer, not just the reader, um, but to the, to the doer. So prepare yourself now to be that wise person uh, in your old age, that person whose youth is being renewed so you can continue to serve the Lord. If you're old, if you're elderly, uh, I'd encourage you, brother or sister, don't put yourself on a shelf. Don't do that. Don't kick back and say, I've done my part. I can do no more. Or they don't want me. They don't need me. Uh, you are wanted. You are needed in the church, whether or not the church knows it. So strive to be an asset to that church. Strive to be available. You may not have the energy to work in the children's church anymore. You may not have the energy to work uh, in the kitchen for uh, snacks and potlucks and things like that. But you could take aside a young man or a young woman and tell them about your life. And not just, you know, your job or your golf score or uh, how you used to be. Don't be one of those uh, older people who the older they get, the better they were. But tell them how the Lord has worked in your life. Give them encouragement. Listen to them. Don't be the know-it-all, but be an asset to those around you. Be a resource and pursue that. Strive for it. And lastly, if you find yourself in that stage of life where you are genuinely feeble, where you are sick or weak or just don't have the energy, uh, I'd encourage you that this time in your life, is the time for you to be preparing to be in the Lord's presence. That you should be as you are in the Psalms with me, in the Psalms with us. And finding your satisfaction as your years come to a close in the Lord. So God bless you. Hope this was helpful for you. Hope this was valuable. And, uh, you know, press on, brothers and sisters. The Lord is going to... Satisfy your years and renew your youth. God bless you.